Welcome to Biology 120, Evolution, Genetics, and Ecology. That seems like a strange mix of things to throw together into one course, and it kind of is. But we do have a theme, we do have a focus, and that focus is information. Not just the information you're going to learn, but the information that's found in living organisms. Living organisms contain blueprints, blueprints that are needed to build cells. And that information, of course, is DNA. We'll talk about how DNA is stored in a cell, how it's replicated when cells divide. We'll talk about how that DNA is interpreted. It contains the instructions needed to make proteins and then proteins do all the work in the cell. We'll talk about how this genetic code is transferred from one generation to the next. And we'll talk about the fact that it changes through several generations. That change, of course, is evolution. Ecology, how does that fit in? Well, ecology is responsible for evolution. The natural world, the non-living world, the environment you find yourself in, that changes information through several generations. It selects for the copies that work best. We'll also talk about how DNA can be manipulated, how it can be manipulated by humans, so genetic engineering, and also how it can be manipulated by things like viruses. Our very first topic is DNA and the gene theory. We'll talk about the structure of DNA, we'll talk about what it is and where it is, and we'll talk a bit about how it functions. A lot of that is going to be review, I hope. The gene theory is the idea that there are discrete segments or sequences of DNA that code for discrete proteins. Essentially, what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of introduce how the blueprints of life work. Alrighty then, here's a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to present things in a slightly different manner than perhaps you're used to. I'm going to do a little bit of history. This is not a history course. I'm not expecting you to know dates, etc. What I'd like you to focus on are the experiments. Some of them are really quite clever. So we'll talk about the experiments that showed us that DNA was the genetic material, the experiments that showed us how DNA is deciphered within cells and also showed us the structure of DNA. We'll talk about the experiments that showed how DNA is replicated. We'll go through this in order, starting at the top. So you'll learn about DNA in kind of the same way that humanity learned about DNA. Next, we'll move on to the central dogma of molecular biology, which is not nearly as scary as it sounds. It's just the idea that DNA is used as a template to make messenger RNA, which is then used to make protein. Finally, we'll talk about the gene theory. As mentioned before, this is the idea that a sequence of DNA codes for a particular protein, and then the protein does work within the cell. Now, I do want to point out that the word theory means something quite different in science than it does in everyday speech. It's not a hunch. A theory is not a hunch in science. A theory is a very well supported and well established model of how things work. Our knowledge of cells goes back quite a ways. Back to the 1600s, there were simple microscopes that people could use to look at cells. And by the 1800s, we knew a little bit about the structure of cells. We knew that there was a nucleus in eukaryotic cells, for instance. And people had watched cells divide and they had watched the nucleus break down and the chromosomes form. But of course, they didn't know what any of that was and what that stuff was for. So we'll start off here by talking about this man, Friedrich Meischer. And what he did was he showed that the nucleus contains a substance known as DNA. He was the first person to characterize DNA chemically. He looked at white blood cells. He was a doctor 
and also a researcher, and he worked in a Swiss hospital. And he would go around from patient to patient and collect bandages that contained a lot of pus. So next to the patient's bed, there would quite often be basically a trash can that would fill up with these dirty bandages, and he would literally collect buckets of pus. Now, what is pus? Well, pus contains a lot of dead cells, a lot of dead white blood cells. So if you have an infection, white blood cells, and that's what you're seeing in the picture here, they're the purpley cells. The, the red ones there are red blood cells. But these cells, these white blood cells, will come along and gobble up bacteria to protect you. And they die in the process. So the pus he was collecting contained a lot of dead white blood cells. And he found that he could take this pus and he could add some detergent and some other chemicals and those white blood cells would break open. So he would rupture the white blood cells and they'd spit out their nuclei. The nuclei are the really, really dark purple structures here. So he managed to purify the nuclei after he had ruptured the cells. He spun the samples in a centrifuge. The nuclei are dense, they sunk to the bottom. So he would purify the nuclei and then he would subject them to alkaline dissolution. This is where you add some very strong alkaline uh, compounds to your tube. So you make it very, very high pH and then you make it very low pH by adding acid. And he probably would have added some ethanol as well. What this process does is it causes the DNA to separate from the nucleus and the DNA will actually precipitate at the bottom of a tube if you spin it in a centrifuge. So again, he isolated the nuclei and then he isolated the DNA out of the nuclei. He was just trying to figure out what was in the nucleus of cells. He coined the term nuclein. So we already had a term for the nucleus. It's at the center of the cell. Nucleus means uh, center or core or kernel. And he named this mysterious substance nuclein. We later called it DNA. And he was able to put it through some chemical tests. And he figured out that nuclein, DNA, contained nitrogen and phosphorus, but interestingly, no sulfur. And we'll talk about why that's interesting in a little bit. In the late 1800s and on into the early 1900s, chemists learned a lot more about that nucleon, enough that they could give it the name deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. So by the early 1900s, we knew that DNA contained three parts. It contained a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and phosphate, but we didn't know how any of those parts were arranged. And of course, we didn't know anything about what DNA did. We also knew that inside the nucleus, there was a lot of protein as well. The chromosomes that we can see under a microscope as a cell divides are half protein and half DNA, but no one knew what the DNA and what the proteins did. So we're going to skip ahead to 1928 and an experiment by a man called Friedrich Griffith. And what Friedrich uh, Griffith showed us was that cells contained information that could actually be inserted into other cells and change them. He did this really cool little experiment using two different strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae. A strain is a slightly different form of a bacterium in this case. So like in dogs, we have different breeds, we have slightly different forms. So they're the same species, but they're a bit different. We have some of the Streptococci that create rough colonies. What you're seeing in this picture on the left is how these bacteria look if we grow them on a petri plate. So each one of those globs there contains millions and millions of bacterial cells. We have these two strains of Streptococcus. One produces rough colonies, which are quite small, 
and the other strain produces these smooth colonies. And if we look at the bacteria under a microscope, and you can see that at the bottom, we see that the rough strain doesn't have a capsule around it, whereas the smooth strain does. So the bacteria that are found in these smooth colonies, they have this capsule, and the capsule contains a lot of protein. It's this really thick coating that helps protect the bacteria. Now what's really interesting is the rough bacteria, if you were to breathe them in or a lab rat were to breathe them in, it wouldn't harm that animal. The rat, uh, his, its immune system would be able to fight this very effectively. But bacteria that have a capsule around them, it makes them really slippery it makes them really difficult for white blood cells to grab onto, and your immune system cannot very effectively fight these cells. So the rough strain is non-lethal. The smooth strain is lethal. If you get that in your body, you can't fight it, and it could kill you. So this little structural difference is really quite important. Here's his classic experiment. A good experiment is going to have some controls. So let's start with that. The controls are on the left. First of all, he did a negative control where he took some of those rough bacteria, the bacteria that don't have the capsule, and put them into a mouse. And the mouse was fine. And again, that's because these rough bacteria can be destroyed by white blood cells quite readily. So they're destroyed by the mouse's immune system. Then he did a positive uh, control. That's treatment number two. He used the S strain, the smooth strain. And sure enough, when he injected that into a mouse, it died. This is the lethal strain. It's lethal because the white blood cells can't kill it. In fact, they try to eat it and it divides inside the white blood cells and kills them. Now we've got two treatments on the right. The first one, he took this lethal S strain, he took the bacteria and he exposed it to heat, enough heat to kill the bacteria. He made sure they were good and dead, and then he took those dead cells and injected them into the mouse. As you might expect, the mouse lives. The cells are dead. They're not gonna do anything. This is the really interesting treatment, treatment four. He took S strain cells that he was sure were dead, they had been heat killed, and then he combined them with living rough strain, non-lethal cells. He let the R strain cells exist within this culture that contained these dead S strain cells for a while when he took that mixture and injected it into a mouse, the mouse died. And then when he collected fluid from the mouse, he found living S-strain bacteria. Where did they come from? Well, what had to have happened is that those living R-strain bacteria took up information from the dead cells. And this is something bacteria do quite often. They will actually gobble up, they'll eat, bits and pieces of DNA in their surroundings, and sometimes they'll incorporate them into their own DNA. So the R strain doesn't have the information needed to make a capsule, but it got that information from the dead S strain cells and incorporated that information into its information. And it became S strain lethal cells and it killed the mouse. He called this transformation. So he suggested this name for where information is passed from one organism to a different organism and it transforms it, it changes it. And this is a term we still use today. Griffith's experiment was very important. It showed us that characteristics like the presence of a capsule, for instance, are coded for by information, and that information can be passed to a different cell, and that cell can change. It can acquire that characteristic.
but his experiments did not tell us anything about what the information was or where it was in the cell. Along came a man named Hammerling in the 1930s that showed us definitively that that information was in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Now remember that Griffith's experiment was using bacteria, they don't have a nucleus. Hammerling worked with these remarkably large eukaryotic cells from a group known as the acetabularia. And these cells are really quite remarkable. Here's a better look at these cells. So each one of those structures, that disc with a stalk on it, is one cell. It's very, very rare for cells to be this big. They're usually microscopic, but these things are huge. They're algae, they're photosynthetic, and they grow in the ocean. These freakishly large cells have a very distinct shape. And I'm sorry I can't stop bringing that up. They're just so big. But anyway, they have a cap at the top and the cap is usually kind of disc shaped or it's kind of fluffy. And what it does is it absorbs sunlight. These guys are photosynthetic algae. At the other end, at the bottom, it has something called a rhizoid, which looks a lot like a root. And that's what it does. It holds the cell firmly to the bottom of the ocean, to a rock, for instance. In experiment A, what he did was he cut off the top of one of these cells. And what he found was that it could regenerate a little bit. It could regenerate the cap and it could regenerate part of the stalk and then it would die. He then took the rhizoid, the bottom part that contains the nucleus and did the same thing. He cut that off, put it aside and let it do its thing and it regenerated a brand new cell. And that cell was healthy and it went on to divide and create more cells. So why the difference? Well, the nucleus obviously contains information. It contains the information needed to make the rhizoid and the stalk and also the cap. And in order for the cell to survive and then to make other cells, it needs to have that information. If you've been paying attention, you might be asking, well, why was the top little bit able to make a cap? Why did it get that far? That's because it contains some messenger RNA. We'll talk about what that means later, but there's messenger RNA floating around in the cell that contains information that's decoded by ribosomes. And there was enough information there to make the stock, but then all that information was used up. We couldn't generate any new messenger RNA and the cell dies. Uh, RNA doesn't last very long, it breaks down. So that's his first experiment. His second experiment was even cooler. He took two different species of these cells that look quite different and he swapped their nuclei. That's pretty cool. That's kind of like taking two people and swapping their brains, although not really. Anyway, you can see that these two species look quite different. Because the cells are so big, you can actually put them under a microscope and you can extract their nuclei. The nuclei are also quite large. You take a very, very fine glass needle and you can suck the nuclei out. And he swapped the two nuclei of these two species, put them back in his aquarium, let them recover, and they changed. So they changed to resemble the other species because that's the information they contain. The information they contain now coded for all the proteins that are needed to make those particular structures. So he changed the identity of these cells and the cells went on quite happily dividing and creating new members of that species. A quick recap, what do we know so far? So at this point in history, we know that cells contain information. We know that that information can be passed to another cell and it will read that information in exactly the same way. And we know that that information is in the nucleus. Now I mentioned that we knew about chromosomes 
long before these more recent discoveries. We knew about chromosomes back in the 1840s. People took cells that were in the process of dividing and they used dyes that would stick to the chromosomes so they were easier to see. And chromosome actually means colored body. Zome means body. Chromos means color. People watch cells divide and they realized that the chromosomes were coming out of the nucleus and they were divided equally during cell division. That sounds pretty important. If a cell is dividing and passing on information, it's going to want to divvy up that information equally between the daughter cells. We knew that chromosomes are a mix of protein and DNA, so the chromosomes had been investigated chemically. But we didn't know whether the protein was the information or the DNA was the information. So chromosomes are actually about half DNA and half protein. And it was thought that the DNA, because it's quite simple, it just is made up of these nucleotides, which are pretty simple and they're repeated over and over again. There's only four of them in DNA. Because DNA was so simple, it was thought that it couldn't possibly be the genetic material. The genetic material certainly has to be something really complex and proteins are more complex. So originally it was thought that the proteins were important and the DNA was just there as a scaffold it was just there to hold the proteins in place while the chromosomes divided. Now we know now, of course, that it's the other way around. The protein is there to protect the DNA. It's quite delicate. And it's there to act as a scaffold to hold the DNA as it's being replicated. But we didn't know that at this point. Moving on to the 1940s and an elegant little experiment done by Oswald Avery and his colleagues Colin McLeod and Maislin McCarty. They repeated Griffith's experiment, but with an important little twist. The experiment went really well, and here's old Ozzy celebrating with some eggnog at the 1944 office Christmas party. Just like Griffith before them, they were working with heat-killed S cells and living R cells. So remember Streptococcus pneumoniae, it's a species of bacteria. We have the S cells that are lethal because they have a capsid and the R cells that are non-lethal because they don't have that capsid. They took the S cells, they killed them with heat, put them into a test tube and then ruptured the cells. So the cells spill out all of their stuff into this test tube. We have kind of a puree of these heat killed S cells. There's four types of macromolecules in cells. We have lipids and carbohydrates, and then we have protein, and then we have the nucleic acids, which consist of RNA and DNA. No one suspected lipids or carbohydrates of being information. So the first thing they did was they extracted the lipids and the carbohydrates. They removed them from this puree. Next, they took that sample, took a bit of it, and added proteases or proteinases. These are enzymes that will break down the protein. They gobble it up and destroy it. They took that solution that no longer contained protein, it only contained DNA and RNA, they added that to their R cells and then injected that mixture into a mouse and the mouse died. So there was something still in that mixture that could transform the R cells and make them lethal. They took another sample of that original mixture and this time they added ribonuclease. Ribonuclease is an enzyme that gobbles up RNA and destroys it. They took that and they added that sample to a solution that contained living R cells, let that sit for a bit, injected that into a mouse, and the mouse died. So transformation had occurred. Again, whatever was left within that tube, and it was protein and DNA, one of those two things was transforming the cells. They took another sample, and this time they added deoxyribonuclease, which is an enzyme that breaks down DNA. They let that sit for a while. They added that solution to a culture of living R cells. 
let that sit for a bit, took that, injected into a mouse, and the mouse lived. No transformation had occurred. So the only thing that can account for this is if DNA is the information, if it's the material responsible for transformation. We've ruled out protein, we've ruled out RNA, we can remove that stuff. So long as we don't remove the DNA, we will get transformation. The Avery experiment was excellent evidence that DNA is the genetic material. It's the information. But of course, in science, we want to test things as many times as possible and in many different ways to be sure we've got the right answer. Along come Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey in the 50s, and they devised another really elegant experiment that showed once again that DNA was definitely the genetic material. They were working with a virus, a virus known as a bacteriophage. This is a virus that only infects bacteria. Now what viruses do is they take their information and they inject it into cells. And then the cells will decode that information and use it to make the proteins that make up new virus. So viruses actually hijack cells. They take over the cell, they insert information, that information is read by the machinery of the cell. The cell unknowingly makes more virus and the virus destroys the cell. Before we proceed any further, we should talk a little bit about isotopes because Hershey and Chase used isotopes to track the route taken by information in their experiment. They used isotopes to identify the molecules responsible. So what is an isotope? An isotope is a form of an element or atom that has a different number of neutrons. So remember in an atom, in the nucleus, we have neutrons and protons, and then circling around that we have electrons. The number of protons and electrons is the same for different isotopes of an element. The number of protons and electrons determine the chemistry of that element. But in different isotopes of an element, we have a different number of neutrons. We have a number of different isotopes that are really important in biology. They're important in biological research. They're important in medicine as well. We'll talk about some of these later. But first of all, we have hydrogen at the top of the periodic table here. Hydrogen is kind of weird because it doesn't usually have a neutron. It has a proton and an electron and that's it. There's a form of hydrogen known as deuterium that has one proton, one electron and one neutron. And that makes it a bit heavier, and we can actually uh, account for that change in mass in experiments. And then we have a form of hydrogen known as tritium that has two neutrons and one proton and one electron, and that would be H3. So the number three there tells us about the atomic mass of the nucleus. It's got three things in the nucleus. It's got two neutrons and one proton. Another important element is carbon. Carbon usually has 12 uh, components inside its nucleus. It's got six neutrons and six protons. But there are other forms of carbon and you might have heard of carbon 14. It's got two extra neutrons. It's kind of important when it comes to dating things, determining how old something is. Uh, we can't use that for dinosaurs. We'll talk about that more. I mean, this course covers so much stuff, uh, but we can use it for dating like an Egyptian mummy or something like that, or a woolly mammoth. Anyway, we'll get to that stuff later. We have nitrogen and for nitrogen, usually we have an atomic weight of 14. We have, seven neutrons and seven protons, but we can have an extra neutron. And then we have N15 and it's a bit heavier and that can be useful as we'll see. We can use isotopes of oxygen. We can use isotopes of phosphorus. And this one's gonna be important in a moment. And we can use isotopes of sulfur to track the movement 
of molecules within a cell or between a virus and a cell in this case. So P32 has a couple of extra neutrons and that actually makes any molecule that contains it radioactive. Quite often, not always, but if we add extra neutrons, sometimes the atom becomes unstable and it will occasionally break down and throw off some particles that we can detect as radiation. And the same with sulfur, S35 has a couple of extra neutrons. It's unstable, it emits radiation, and we can track that radiation and track the movement of a radioactive substance containing sulfur, 35, within a cell or between a virus and a cell. This is the virus that Hershey and Chase used in their experiments. As mentioned, it's a bacteriophage. That is a virus that only infects bacteria. It doesn't infect eukaryotic cells like our cells. The particular virus they use, this T2 bacteriophage, infects E. coli. Those are bacteria that are grown in the lab quite often. We have them in our intestines as well. In these viruses, there's only two components. There's protein and then there's DNA. So the bottom part, this part here, is comprised of protein. And that whole bottom portion is used to attach to a bacteria cell. The top part, the head, as it's labeled here, consists of something known as a capsid. That's the actual hollow container. And within that hollow container is DNA. So the capsid is made of protein. The bottom part of the virus is made of protein. And then inside that hollow capsid is DNA. On the right, we can see three viruses that have attached to an E. coli cell, and they're injecting something, as you can see. And we know that they're injecting DNA, and Hershey and Chase suspected that that's what was happening as well. Bacteriophages inject information into a bacterial cell. The bacterial cell is tricked into decoding that information and making more virus. That information is a blueprint for virus. And typically the bacteria cell fills up with about 200 or so viruses. And then the cell ruptures, they spill out, the viruses go on and they infect other cells. Hershey and Chase did two experiments. For the first experiment, what they did was they radioactively labeled their protein. What I mean by that is they took their viruses and they let them reproduce over and over again in a culture of bacteria, but the only source of sulfur was radioactive. Now think back to the beginning of this lecture. I mentioned that DNA contains nitrogen and phosphorus, but it doesn't contain any sulfur. Protein contains a lot of sulfur. So after these bacteriophages or phages had been grown in this solution, their proteins were radioactive because their proteins contained this S35. They took their radioactive viruses and they transferred them to a new solution. They actually washed them off, made sure they were nice and clean and transferred them to a new solution with new bacteria and they allowed them to infect those bacteria. So what happens is the viruses will stick to the outside of the bacteria. This is not to scale, by the way, viruses are much, much smaller, but the viruses would stick to the outside of the bacteria and then they would inject their information. After that, what's left on the outside is just an empty shell that can't do anything. So after the viruses had injected their information, they took that culture and they put it into basically a blender and just pulsed it a couple times gently. And that was enough to shake off that empty protein shell. Then they could take that solution and they could spin it in a centrifuge. And what happens is 
the heavier stuff, the bigger stuff, the denser stuff is going to settle out to the bottom. It's going to form a pellet at the bottom. So if you remember back to kind of basic chemistry and basic biology, when you spin a sample of something in a tube in a centrifuge, if there's any heavy stuff, it forms a pellet at the bottom and the liquid portion above that is known as the supernatant. And what they found was that the radioactivity remained in the supernatant and the pellet that was made up of bacteria cells only did not contain any radioactivity. In their second experiment, they radio labeled the DNA. They made the DNA radioactive. So they would have taken bacteriophage, added it to a culture of bacteria, and this time the only source of phosphorus in that solution was radioactive, it was P32. They allowed the viruses to regenerate, to reproduce through several generations, and their DNA became radioactive, but their proteins did not because protein does not contain any phosphorus. Then they took those active viruses, they cleaned them up, and they put them into a new uh, culture sample with new bacteria. They allowed them to attach and inject their genetic material. They took that solution, they put it into a blender, a couple quick pulses to shake off the empty containers, known as ghost, phage ghosts, that were still attached to the outside. They centrifuged that sample and they found that the pellet that contained just the bacteria was radioactive. The supernatant that contained just those empty shells of protein was not radioactive. So whatever it was that the uh, bacteriophages had injected into the cells made the cells radioactive. And of course, we know the only thing that was injected was DNA. To summarize, these two experiments showed that DNA was injected into the cell. Well, the protein stayed on the outside attached to the cell. So in the first experiment, the supernatant was radioactive, and that's because that was the experiment using S35 that labeled the protein. The protein did not pass through the cell wall and the membrane. It didn't get into the cell. The second experiment, showed that the DNA passed into the cell because in this case, the cell pellet was radioactive and it was the DNA that had been radio labeled with P32. So the material that's required, the blueprint, the instructions that are needed for making virus are contained on DNA and not protein. I realize this is a somewhat complex experiment, so let's take one last look at it. We have our phage, our bacteriophage. The green here is protein, and the blue is DNA. So we have this protein coat that consists of these legs that latch on to the cell, and then an empty capsid that contains the DNA. The DNA is inserted into the cell. We know that now, and we owe that to experiments like the experiment by Hershey and Chase. So remember in their experiment, they labeled the protein with radioactive sulfur, S35. That stayed on the outside of the cell. It didn't enter the cell. So it has nothing to do with the infection, obviously. The DNA did enter the cell, and that's the information needed to create new viruses. That shaking is what happens in the blender, and it knocks off the, uh, the protein, the capsid and the tailpiece, and then that ends up in the supernatant. In the second experiment, they labeled the DNA with radioactive phosphorus, conducted the same experiment again, showed that it was the DNA that was inserted because when they shook off the empty protein ghost, they were left 
with this radioactive protein in the pellet, in the pellet that contained the bacterial cells. And incidentally, the viruses that erupted from the cell were also radioactive. By the early 1950s, everyone was in agreement. DNA is the genetic material. And now the race was on to figure out the structure of DNA and to figure out how it worked. Now, long before this, again, back in the early 1900s, we knew a little bit about the chemistry of DNA. We knew the bits and pieces that made it up. We knew that nucleic acids, so RNA and DNA, were made up of three parts. Phosphate, notice that the phosphate has two negative charges to it. That's going to be important later. A sugar, which was ribose in RNA, or deoxyribose in DNA, and also a nitrogenous base, which consisted of one or two organic rings containing nitrogen. The nitrogenous bases, as we'll see later, are the really important part. They actually contain the information. They can be placed into one of two groups. We have the pyrimidines, which are smaller. They consist of one organic ring, and that would be thymine and cytosine in DNA. And then we have the purines, which are wider. They consist of two organic rings, and that would be adenine and guanine in DNA. There are several different ways to represent these structures that you might come across in my lecture notes or in your textbook. At the top here, we have a simplified drawing of a pyrimidine and a purine. And although it's not shown, wherever we have a ring-like structure like this, at the apex here, if nothing is drawn, we know that that is a carbon. So excuse my terrible drawing with my mouse here, but those would all be carbons. And then, of course, in this particular example, we have two nitrogens as well. And each one of those atoms is numbered. If we have just one line between two carbons, for instance, here, that's a single bond. If we have two, that would be a double bond. With the purine, again, we have two rings. Same kind of thing. If we don't actually have a letter there, you could just assume that it's a C. That's where we would have carbon. I'm not going to draw all of them, but you get the idea. And we do have lots of nitrogens. That's why they have the name nitrogenous bases. Down the bottom here, we have a space filling model. This is perhaps a bit more uh, in line with reality, but reality at this scale is kind of difficult to determine. But in those uh, figures there, we have white representing hydrogen, which isn't even included on the top diagrams. We have blue representing nitrogen, and the gray represents the carbons. So why am I even talking about this stuff right now? Well, I want to talk a bit more about the history, of course, and uh, that leads us up to Erwin Kargaff, this handsome guy here down the bottom. He realized that if he took a piece of DNA and analyzed it and separated it out into its monomers, there was always an equal number of purines and pyrimidines, always the same number. So for example, if he looked at a piece of DNA and let's say that this piece of DNA contained 15% adenine, and he broke it down and analyzed all the parts, just based on that, he could predict that it's going to have 15% thymine, 35% cytosine, and 35% guanine. So 15, 15, 35, 35, that adds up to 100. Another way to say this, and this is the way he actually said it, is that the amount of pyrimidine in any piece of DNA, doesn't matter what the sequence is, is always going to be equal to the amount of purine. 
So we have 50% of each. This became known as Cargaff's rule. Now he didn't name it that, he wasn't quite that arrogant, but the rule states that the amount of purine is always gonna be equal to the amount of pyrimidine. So 50% of each, it doesn't matter what sequence of DNA you're looking at. You could grab a random sequence of DNA from a slug, from a human, from a tree, whatever. This rule always applies. And to break it down a little bit more, the amount of adenine, or A, is always equal to the amount of thymine, or T. And the amount of guanine, G, is always equal to the amount of cytosine. When it comes to DNA, there was just so much going on in the 1950s. Moving on to our next really important researcher, Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin was doing something known as X-ray diffraction crystallography. Now, I am certainly no expert on this, so I'll simplify this greatly. Basically, what you do is you take a pure sample of a substance, in her case, DNA. You take this very pure sample and you crystallize it in such a way that all the molecules align parallel to each other. You take this crystal and you shine x-rays through it. The x-rays will pass through this crystal and bounce off of the molecules where they're detected afterwards by a sheet of photographic film. Now, if you have an expertise in this area, the images that are created by doing this can tell you quite a lot about the shape of the molecule. What we're seeing in the bottom right-hand corner is one of Rosalind Franklin's images. We've got this X-shaped design on this photograph. And again, for people that do X-ray crystallography like this, this is something that can point towards a helical structure. A helix is a spiral. Now, Rosalind Franklin, when she did this work, she was very close to understanding the significance of it, but she wasn't quite there. She probably would have been there very, very soon. Notice that Rosalind Franklin died very young. She died at the age of 37. She died of cancer, and although it's not proven, that may be in part due to the high energy x-rays she was working with. She had a very, very important part of the puzzle when it comes to the structure of DNA, and that's what we're leading up to. And by most accounts, she didn't receive the credit that she deserved for that, but we'll, we'll come back to that. No doubt you've heard about these two guys, Francis Crick and James Watson. Quite often, people will erroneously say that they discovered DNA, and hopefully you realize now that's, that's not the fact. DNA was discovered back in the 1800s, but they did piece together the structure of DNA. They didn't do this on their own, and in fact, most of their model is not based on their own research. It's based on the research of other scientists. That's not a bad thing, it's not an uncommon thing. They looked at the research that was going on and they pieced it all together to come up with a working model for the shape of DNA. And you can see in their classic picture on the right there, they've got a bunch of lab equipment, retort stands, etc., whatever they get their hands on that they're using to build this model of DNA. Once it was concluded that DNA was the genetic material, there was this rush of activity by many, many researchers to try to figure out the structure of DNA and how it worked. And there were several models that were proposed. Some people thought that the phosphates were on the inside 
and the nitrogenous bases were on the outside. Watson and Crick originally thought that. Watson and Crick and others also originally thought that maybe there were three strands of nucleotides instead of two, as we now know. They decided that the phosphates were likely on the outside because that was a more stable configuration. That makes sense. The phosphates are negatively charged. They can interact with water. You might remember from your chemistry classes that water has a dipole to it. What that means is that the hydrogens are slightly positive and the oxygens are slightly negative, and that's because the oxygens have a higher electronegativity and they steal the electrons away from the hydrogen. So the water can interact with the phosphates, and then the nitrogenous bases can form hydrogen bonds with each other. So that's stable. We want to try to balance out all of those charges. The second conclusion they made about the structure of DNA relates back to Cargaff's rule. Remember that Cargaff said that a purine will always pair up with a pyrimidine. A purine has two organic rings, a pyrimidine has only one, so that means we have three rings across the width of a DNA molecule, assuming the nitrogenous bases are in the middle. That makes sense because there was nothing to suggest that the width of the DNA molecule changed. So if we have this Cargaff's rule, that means we always have three rings across and the width of the DNA molecule remains constant. This also fit with the hydrogen bonding that had been observed between nitrogenous bases. So what is a hydrogen bond? Well, they're shown in this diagram as red dots. Let's take a look at the top here. We have this hydrogen and it is forming a bond with this nitrogen and it's a polar covalent bond. What that means is the electrons are not being shared equally. The electrons are being pulled towards the nitrogen because the nitrogen is more electronegative. That means it has a higher affinity for electrons. That means the nitrogen becomes slightly negative and the hydrogen becomes slightly positive. If we look at the thymine, the same sort of thing is going on. We have a carbon down here and electrons are being pulled away from the carbon towards the oxygen and the oxygen becomes slightly negative. So the hydrogen is slightly positive, the oxygen is slightly negative, they form a weak bond. Adenine and thymine, just because of the way the hydrogens and nitrogens and oxygens are arranged, form two hydrogen bonds, whereas guanine and cytosine form three. And in fact, if you have a piece of DNA that has a lot of guanine and cytosine, it's actually more difficult to pull the two strands apart. The last piece of evidence, and perhaps the most important, was that image taken by Rosalind Franklin. She did not immediately recognize that X pattern on this image of the crystal as indicating that DNA was a spiral molecule, but Watson and Crick did. When they first saw it, they realized the significance of this. They had been, of course, doing a lot of research on this subject and it all came together for them. Now, Rosalind Franklin and her supervisor and her colleagues and Watson and Crick had done a lot of collaboration together and there was a lot of give and take and back and forth, but there's a strong suggestion that Rosalind Franklin did not know Watson and Crick saw this image. Uh, they saw it without her permission. And because of that, she never got the recognition that she deserved. Watson and Crick and also another researcher in the Rosalind Franklin lab were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the structure of DNA. And unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin was not included. It's an interesting topic. There's lots to read about it if you're interested. Uh, just realize it's, it's actually quite hazy and quite complex what actually occurred. But it definitely, we can say that uh, Franklin did not get the credit she deserved. In any case, so looking at all of this evidence, 
Watson and Crick figured out that we had this helical shaped structure that consisted of two strands wrapped around each other. They named that the double helix. Helix means spiral. There's two strands wrapped around each other with the nitrogenous bases on the inside. They wrote a very short paper about this. It's actually just a page long. You're seeing half of it right there. Probably one of the most important papers in biology. Updated reality check. Where are we now? We know for sure beyond any reasonable doubt that DNA is the genetic material. And we now know the structure of DNA. It consists of two strands of nucleotides wrapped around each other. The backbone of each strand is made up of a sugar, deoxyribose, and phosphate. And in the diagram on the far left, you can see that backbone, the phosphate and sugar, represented as these blue ribbons. In the middle, we have our nitrogenous bases, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds are fairly weak, but there's a lot of them, so this is a fairly stable molecule. Another thing to note, something we will come back to, is that the strands run in opposite directions. What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at this deoxyribose on one side, compare it to the deoxyribose on the other, you can see that the sugars are arranged in different configurations. They're pointing up with the oxygen at the top on the left and pointing down with the oxygen at the bottom on the other side. We'll come back to the significance of that. On the right, we have a space filling molecule of DNA, and this has been thoroughly tested. And uh, yeah, we know what DNA looks like now. The paper written by Watson and Crick was short and sweet, and their model was quite simple. And in science, we favor simple. Generally, the simplest explanation for the observations you make is the best explanation something known as Occam's razor that we might talk about again later. In their paper, they also made this rather interesting statement. They said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. What they were saying was that those fairly weak hydrogen bonds that hold the nucleotides together could be unzipped a few at a time quite easily by a cell. And that would expose nucleotides that could serve as a template to make the corresponding strand. And we'll talk about how that works in our next PowerPoint. Because we're close to an hour now and I'm getting sick of listening to myself talk. So I think I'm gonna cut it off here and then continue this in part two. In part two of topic one, we'll have a look at how DNA is copied and the experiments that showed us how DNA was copied. And we'll also talk about the genetic code. We haven't talked about that yet, really. We haven't talked about what this sequence of T's and G's and A's and C's actually does. So we'll talk about how that works and how we figured that out as well. So stay tuned and I'll talk to you again very soon.